Right, so I'm delighted to be interviewing Leon Chambers, award-winning director of indie film Above the Clouds, a British coming-of-age road movie, comedy drama. Uh, a few years ago, Leon secured the rights to one of my short stories and is currently working with screenwriter Simon Law to turn it into a screenplay. Uh, today, we're going to be discussing how a director works to turn the written word into a visual spectacle and what he looks for in a story. Leon, thank you for joining me. No problem. Happy to be here. Uh, so question number one, um, when you see a script or story, what qualities tell you it has cinematic potential? I think it's, well, uh, the overall thing is always the actual story itself. The story arc is a really big part of it because one of the sort of issues with um, like a novel is there's so much of it to condense into a film because you're always condensing. Um, so you're really looking at the, at what the actual story is and then reimagining how, you know, I mean, I tend to be, I read something and then, you know, I see it as a film because as I'm reading it, I'm visualizing and actually seeing the story myself and how I would imagine it. So I think it's, it's hard to put a, to pin anything on it, but I think it, it's, it's about the overall story as opposed to the detail or anything else, but it's just mainly the, what is the, yeah, what, what's the, the thrust of the thing? Does a, does a character, uh, a strong character, um, appeal to you in, in, in a story? Yeah, I think that does as well. I mean, I think, um, yeah, it could, it's, it could be a story arc, it could be a character, um, you know, it could be various aspects that you look at and you could see, you know, I think that for me, it is very much about when I'm reading something, if I can imagine it as a film, then it suddenly... It instantly jumps off the page. Yeah, yeah, you kind of see it in that, in that way. Mind. Yeah. Um, can you tell us something about the way that you, you work with a, a screenwriter to sort of develop an idea and, and ready it for, for actually filming? Well, I tend to, um, I tend to work, uh, you know, um, via talking and meeting with, with a writer as opposed to giving loads of notes, which is quite unusual. A lot of directors will uh, get a, a, a treatment uh, or some kind of synopsis and look at it and give notes back on that, literally written notes. I tend to do it by talking. Um, and that's, I just find that's where I can be more... Uh, more helpful and ideas come to me in conversation so you know with Simon when we were developing um, my film Above the Clouds um, it was literally he would write a script I would read it, read it or you know write a, a treatment and I would read it and then we'd sit and talk about it and it's through that discussion that we solve and find problems and move the project forward That's quite so a relationship in that that sense. Yeah, I mean, I just find for me, you know, that's my my way of, of interacting and of finding that. And I find sometimes just reading it and making notes that I can't solve things, whereas we get into a discussion about it. Um, that's where we can find some solutions. And you, you think the personality of, of both parties has something to to play in it? You're, you're talking about how you, you bounce ideas off each other. I, I yeah. There's a risk that sometimes an idea falls flat because the person doesn't understand where you're coming from. Maybe, but I think that's kind of where I found, you know, the, the sort of writing partnership between me as a director and a writer, when it works well is when we both are on the same page and we can, you know, I mean, Simon and I, during the writing of Clouds, you know, there was one moment where we had a meeting and I told him that basically the last third of the film didn't work. And as opposed to him kind of, you know, throwing his, toys out the pram and marching off and everything else he went yeah you're probably right right okay what's the solution then and we both kind of knew if one of us had a doubt about something there was probably a reason for it and if we instantly if I didn't instantly have it or he didn't instantly have that doubt that we'd look at it and and find and find a solution through it and in terms you you may not know the answer to this this is probably more for Simon but in terms of the final product when Simon saw the film do you know whether he actually um, recognised it as the project that you were talking about earlier and, and the changes that you were? Yeah, no, I, I, I think he did. What was quite interesting, actually, is the, actually the, the director of photography on the film, when he saw the first cut of it, said, this is the, the most sort of true to a script I've ever seen a film. Mm. 
as things change quite a lot. But for, for, for the way we worked and the way my sort of approach, I didn't want to go on set and start filming until we had a script we knew was as solid as it could be. So I always knew the film was going to be like the script because I knew we got the script right. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so so often films start where the script isn't, isn't right and then they're rewriting and rewriting all the way through the process of shooting it. Um, and then you look at the original script compared with the final film and they're very different. But I had faith in the, the script that, that Simon had written. And were the characters, so, so you obviously um, auditioned for the actors to, to play the characters, but did you feel the characters were already cast through the the script or did the the actors bring something completely different to it well interestingly i think we just got the casting right um and andy who played oz um one of the lead characters in the film um is someone who's worked a lot in theater and you know you quite often in theater you're sort of taught to trust the, the text you know trust the script there's a reason a script is you know, is what it is and has been done many times before or whatever. You know, if it's good writing, it's good writing and all the clues are going to be in there. And he felt that with this script. He felt he could read it and he knew the answer to who this character was through through the writing, yeah. which is a very big compliment to Simon and his writing, which made my life easy because, you know, the, Naomi and, and Andy, who played the two leads, were basically very quickly and instantly the characters I needed them to be because they got it. So it sounds like the investment in the the development of the, the screenplay paid off, really. Oh, totally, totally. Um, right, now on to a, a really meaty question for you. So ho Hollywood's notorious for translating famous books to the silver screen and losing the magic of the novel. Is it possible to capture the full magic of a book through film or should we always accept compromises needed? you have to accept compromise. And there's a very obvious reason for that. If you were to make a feature film of most novels, they would be hours long. They, they would, you know, they'd be like a, an American series of 24, you know, hour long episodes. Um, because you're starting with something, if you were to read a book out loud, and you know, if you've ever looked at an audio book or whatever, um, a lot of them are a good few hours long. That's how long the film would be if you had all the detail and everything that is in there. So you're always looking at, you know, someone once said it was like a sculpture, that you, you have this life-size sculpture being the novel. In order to make the film, you end up with one this big that isn't quite as detailed. So again, back to what I said originally, you're kind of looking at the main story and then finding that structure. So things like the final uh, Harry Potter book ended up as being two films. Uh, and, you know, Lord of the Rings obviously is, you know, put across many films. And it, that's all done just because, you know, it, they're big stories. And so you need to find a way. Now, the flip of that is how short stories work really well for film. Stephen King um, being the most... Absolutely. So The Shawshank Redemption is a perfect example because you're taking a story that actually, if you told that story um, as the short story, it probably wouldn't be that much shorter than, a, than you know, it'd probably be an hour long. Mm. But then you've got something you can build upon and make into a full-length film. So it's a, you're starting from something that you can build as opposed to trying to compact as much as you can into a, a short space of time. So it's always that kind of way around, that you kind of, a short story is a, is a really good jumping off point for a, for a film. So like the short story of yours that we're, Simon and I are looking at, you know, that's got a, a very defined um, story that we can, you know, we're finding so many ways of taking it forward and developing it further. But it's, it's that kind of nugget that is the main yeah, basis yeah. that we you're, can then... You're, you're allowed to go slightly uh, in different directions with the characters and the story itself, just staying true to the, the idea of that story <clears throat> that you've been uh, referring to. Yeah, I think the problem with, 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 I mean, I always think if you look at it with, with novels, if you look at a novel and you look at a radio play and then you look at a film, when you read a novel, you create all the pictures and you create all the characters and their voices and everything else. So what happens if someone reads a novel and loves it, they know what that novel should sound like and look like because they've created it all themselves. 
So a radio play version, you give half the clues, you get the voices. So do those char those characters might sound the same as, as that person sort of felt they were when they read it. Um, but then when you make a film, all those decisions are made. You're saying what the world, you're showing what the world is like, you're hearing what the world is like. So I think a lot of reasons that people don't, don't like the film versions of their favorite novels is that, you know, directors can't see inside people's heads. No, it's a very personal experience. It's a very personal thing because it's your personal interpretation of the story you've read. Mm. Mm. Um, next question. So you've worked with many of the top British actors through your radio and audio work. Uh, in your opinion, what are the secrets to writing believable dialogue? <sighs> Dialogue's tricky. And I think this is, again, where you know, a lot of people um, really sort of uh, congratulated Simon on his writing on our film was because he wrote a character of a sort of 18 year old young woman and he's a 30 something year old man. Mm. Um, and he wrote something very believable that people were kind of saying, how did you write this? This sounds like a, a young woman. Um, and he said he based it on people and everything else. But the thing is with dialogue that I think where it falls down is people don't speak correct English and they don't speak in complete sentences. I mean, the amount of time someone sort of asks something and someone goes, yes, no, no, yeah, you, and they said yes and no in that same response. But, but that's how people speak. So I think the art of dialogue is actually writing stuff that feels natural and how people would, would speak. So the fact that half sentences are there, that people stop halfway through or, or whatever. And a lot of actors, you know, a lot of actors, you know, really good actors love a great script. Because if you have a great script and it's got great dialogue, it makes their life easy because they're not having to try and work hard to make it feel believable. Mm. So I think the thing, the main thing to think about with writing dialogue is actually you know, reading out loud, think about how people talk saying it and going, you know, do people talk like this? Um, so yeah, that's kind of, I think the best way of looking at it. I think I found when, when I was starting out in writing, I would try to make a point and I'd have a framework with which to make that point in my dialogue. And so it was a very much listed, set of phrases to get to that point to explain it to the audience mm. but if you actually listen to speech it doesn't follow a regimented framework it, it can go off on a tangent because it because it's a partnership or multiple partnerships you can never calculate it's, what it's evolving isn't it yeah. it's evolving a conversation exactly. and so, i mean i didn't know you were going to interrupt there and raise a, a different point so the conversations evolved as you just said by yeah. that intervention and, and that's the nature of uh, conversation so you can still make the point but you have to be far more subtle and uh, realistic in, in that approach I uh, next question so you're a big fan of Hitchcock as I well know mm -hmm. so what lessons um, might translate for both film and literature uh, in terms of how the master builds suspense and delivers shocks and surprises, how 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 would you advise a writer or a filmmaker to capture that? Well, I think from a filmmaking point of view, what Hitchcock gets or got brilliantly was how powerful the mind is. So his idea of of do it, of suspense and everything is not to actually show the final thing not it's always to imply and let your brain fill in the gaps so you know horror movies that are all sort of very graphic and slasher type things you know would never be a route he would go down because he'd want your brain to do the work and i think that relates to you know equally to to writing and to novels is that you know you need to set stuff stuff up that allows the audience or the reader to think um, and I think for me that I think I mean he made there was there's various points he talks about there's a very famous story he talks about a film sabotage one of his early films where he feel he feels he got it wrong because he blew a, bu a bus up 
and you f you follow this young man or boy or walking around with what you know is a bomb and he gets on the bus and the bus goes up and and people die and there were two things from that people were shocked when it was screened especially in that era 1930s that he'd shown that but he also thought that actually by the bomb going off he's resolved something so all the tension that he built up suddenly dissipated and you know he could have done two things he could have had the bomb didn't work or someone picked it up and threw it out the window and everyone saved but but by the bomb going off it kind of ends it and makes it final and all the tension goes and he later told a story about the way to do tension is you know you put a bomb under a table you show a clock you show a clock on the bomb was when it's going off and you keep playing those two things and you certainly show that the people around the table are unaware of it so it's it's all about you know what you show i mean there was another example he gave which i think is really key in rear window you see um you know james stewart looking out stuck in his in his wheelchair with his broken leg and he looks out with some binoculars and if he looked out and saw uh, a mother with a small child and then you cut back to a shot of him and he's smiling you kind of think oh nice man seeing this this woman with a child you show that same shot but as opposed to the woman with the child you show a woman in a bikini these are hitch's words not mine and you cut back to him and you think he's a bit of a lech and his reaction is identical yeah. but it's perspective about what you're showing in relation to so i think what he always did was all about yeah the perspective what are you showing what are you what are you asking the audience to look for and you're leaving them to fill in the answers there was a an early draft of uh, liberty bound which i shared with a an editor and I had a big disclosure moment in it. And the lead character in my early version just accepts the facts as played out to him. And that was it. it so it was a big scene, end of a chapter, big disclosure. And I'd already lost all the, the uh, suspense and uh, doubt that should have been generated at that moment by yeah. the, the lead character accepting the situation. She told me to draw it out. And so the next chapter then becomes this personal uh, journey for the, the lead character to actually uncover the truth. And also you're allowed to uh, disclose the evidence and information to the audience in a, a subtle way, such, such that they slowly build up um, the knowledge to actually join the lead character in accepting uh, what has happened so that was a, a lesson that I learned uh, during the actual writing process yeah um, and, I, and I imagine your view is that lots of modern films with their inclination to show too much haven't really understood the the lesson from Mr Hitchcock well I think so I like I like a film that leaves you thinking you know um, and there's certain films that, you know, for example, The Sixth Sense, and I'm working on the basis that there's not a spoiler alert for people. Um, but when I heard there was a twist, I sat and watched it. And in the first scene, I went, I reckon he's dead. And it fitted and it ruined the entire film for me. But when the reveal happened, loads of people in the cinema, you could hear the shock and everyone working out. And they reveal it twice. They say what it is. They show what it is. They then do a flashback sequence. And for me, it's like... Oh, come on, if yeah, people haven't got it by now. Insulting, patronising yeah. to the audience, isn't it? But having said that, there were a lot of people in that cinema who hadn't cottoned yeah. on and hadn't got it. Well, so I think, I think it's a tricky thing. It's a, th a tricky thing of going, are you being too clever as a filmmaker and expecting an audience to work stuff out and t showing them too much and, and answering too many questions? So I think it's, it's, a, it's something... From China's watching this, I, I think... It won't be a, a spoiler for them, will it? Because I, I understand they, they changed the title of this film. What, it's something that isn't he, um, he's it's, dead? Yeah, it's sort of a, about the, the boy who's dead or something like that. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. There you go. It's, it's <laughs> something called suspense. <laughs> or yeah. how to read some really suspense cool. straight away. Yeah. Um, so following the success of your short films, you worked on a feature film. 
uh, and released that last year, was it, or the year before? Um, earlier this year is when it got released, yeah. So can you, can you tell, a bit of, uh, tell us a bit about it and uh, the success it's had? I can see some awards in the background there. <laughs> um, and, and the poster, in fact. And the poster. Um, yeah, um, well, it's, it's a story that I've had in my head for ages. And it's basically about a young woman who discovers her father's, not her biological father. Um, she lives down in Kent. Um, and she, her parents have gone away on holiday, left her on her own. And uh, she discovers they bought her a car, which they've yet to give her. Um, and she decides she wants to go on a road trip to find her real father, but she can't drive. Um, so she persuades a homeless man she's met to be her responsible adult and sit in the passenger seat so she can make this drive from um, Margate in Kent to the Isle of Skye in Scotland. So it's a kind of comedy road movie between an 18 year old woman and a homeless man, uh, Charlie and Oz. And um, yeah, so it's something we, as I've wanted to make for ages. Simon got on board as the writer and um, we got to a point where we just decided we were going to find a way of making it. And we, got the, we shot the film in 2016, um, completed it a couple of years later. These things take time, particularly when you're working on a budget. Um, and then we entered into festivals because film festivals for indie films is the way you get them out there and people hear about them. Um, and we were really fortunate that we actually ended up with a number of festivals all wanting the world premiere. Um, and we actually settled on the world premiere in the UK with the Raindance Film Festival, which is the biggest indie film festival in the UK. And then we played um, the American film um, world premiere, oh, American premiere, sorry, um, at the Austin Film Festival, which is known as the Writers Film Festival. Um, it's amazing. I mean, they have a conference there and you'll meet screenwriters who've written some of the biggest movies and TV programs in the world there. It's where they, um, yeah, all the sort of screenwriters congregate. And we were fortunate we won the audience award there for the for best narrative feature. Um, went off, won a few number more awards. And uh, in fact, at Austin met uh, the distributor who eventually we signed the deal with. Um, and it went out... Um, on VOD, Video On Demand, um, worldwide, beginning of this year. Um, so it's available on Amazon and Google Play and I, iTunes and all these sort of things. I mean, in America, it's on Amazon Prime included in the, in the subscription, which is great um, when you consider there's, I think, 100 million subscribers in America. So uh, it's, yeah, it's getting out. Then we've got some lovely reviews and some great feedback. So yeah, it's out in the world and their journey continues. Wonderful. Well done. So uh, what are you working on at the moment and uh, what have you got in the pipeline? Well, Simon and I are still working on the, <laughs> the feature of your short story, um, which is going to be called Then Again. That's the working title, at least. Um, I, won't, I won't give anything away just yet. People have to wait and see. Um, but also... <laughs> exactly. Um, but also because of, you know, the pandemic in the first first lockdown i decided that um it was a a perfect opportunity to explore an animation idea that i wanted to make uh, i've always sort of loved stop frame animation and I, I made a few when i was in my teens shooting on super 8 in those days of film um so i kind of started building the set and i've been on a couple of sort of model building courses with Ardman Animation. So that's something I'm sort of working on as a sort of a, a project while we're, well, we're now in tier three. So we're <laughs> in this world of lockdown into a tier level and everything else. Um, but um, so yeah, it's, it's a nice, it's a, it means I can still be telling stories and working on, on a film project um, without actually having to leave the house. Wonderful. So, uh... Thank you very much. Thank you for making the time to speak to me. Um, I no, happy highly, to. I can highly recommend Above the Clouds, exceptional film. Uh, and as you say, it's available on Amazon, iTunes, and lots of other streaming platforms. So I encourage people to pay it a visit. Uh, and best of luck with your stop motion and other projects. Thanks ever so much.